Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Welcome to a new edition of the Sports Shop 27. I'm your host, Jermaine Cota. And to my far right, I got my co-host, Kevin Johnson, KJ. And today's special guest in the middle right here, we got a right. former UGA small forward. This guy also played with the 76ers in the NBA, the Lakers, the Phoenix Suns, the Charlotte Bobcats, uh, Cleveland Cavaliers. And he also played overseas. Um, went to Georgia, went in it, made it to the NIT in 1999, and uh, went to the NBA, played a few years. Uh, we have no other than Jumaine Jump. What's going on, Jumaine? That's right. What's, go what's going on, fellas? I, right, right, right. I appreciate y'all having me, man. No problem, no problem, oh, man. man. We're both to Sports Shot 27. Yes, sir. Glad to have you on the show. Uh, for the people that don't know you, let them know where you're from. A little bit about your background, Jermaine. Um, uh, it's funny, man. A lot of people think I'm from Georgia originally, man, but I'm actually born and raised uh, in Cocoa, Florida. I know a lot of people don't know where that is, but it's like 45 yeah, minutes south of Daytona Beach, probably about 10, 15 minutes from where the space shuttle takes off at. Okay. Um, uh, end up uh, moving to to a small town called Camilla, Georgia, uh, when I was 13 years old, Georgia. and. Uh, you know, coming up in the background in Cocoa, Florida, man. Anybody that knows anything about that area, you know, you know that it was it, it was drug infested. You know, it was a lot, a lot of things that was going on in that area. And at, at the age of 13 years old, uh, I witnessed a murder. And, you know, after going through all that kind of stuff, man, my mom was like, okay, that's it, man. You know, seen too much too early. You know, it's time for you to move you know, move in another place. So she moved me, uh, you know, with her sister, which is my aunt, uh, to this small town called Camilla, Georgia, man. She was out on 40 acres of land, um, had all kind of crops and stuff. So a lot of people say I'm a country boy. Country so, boy. So uh, I went to high school there, and that's when I kind of inherited the name, uh, the thriller from Camilla. So that's why a lot of people think uh, that I'm from Georgia, but, you know, uh, Camilla is definitely one of the places that made me into who I am today. Uh, yeah. Hey, talk about talk about what age you started playing sports and what sport was your first love. Can you hear me? I, I can't hear you. Is your man? You can hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Tell him. Tell him my question. I'm just kidding. Okay. He said, what age did you start playing sports and what sport was your first love? I, I can't hear you. Okay. Can y'all hear me? Yeah. yeah. I can hear you. Yeah, I can't hear y'all. Yeah, you probably got to go out and come back in. Can you go out and come back in? Yeah. Yeah, I got, I got my volume all the way up. I, I just can't, I can't hear y'all. Mm. Um, maybe can you can you text me, Jermaine? One second. Can you can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Y'all can hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I, I I don't know why I don't know what's going on. This can't hear y'all for some reason. All right. How about now? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? It's on his end, man. You just got to go out and come back in. But he can't hear us. All right, he just went out.
I can I can hear you. Hello? Yep. There yeah. it is. All right, all right. Sorry for the technical difficulties for the people that's watching. Um, we have today's special guest, former UGA and NBA small forward, Jermaine Jones. Uh, played with the 76ers in 2001 with uh, Iverson, Eric Snow, when they made it to the NBA Finals against the Lakers. Um, so talk about, um, KJ just asked a question. He said, yeah. um, what, he said, what was your favorite sport growing up? And um, like, who were some of your big influences? Man, it, it's funny, man, because I grew up in Florida. Everybody know that's like a football state. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like all my family played football. You know what I mean? A lot of, and, and the weird thing is about it, like all of my friends played basketball. Mm -hmm. um, and the only thing that really influenced me to play is that, you know, when I went outside to go play, all of my uh all of my friends was at basketball practice. Yeah. You know what I mean? So 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 just from that, you know, I was like, okay, well, let me let me go out here and try out for this basketball team. Take it. A lot of people don't know this, but I, I didn't touch basketball until I was eleven years old. You wow. know what I mean? That was that was like seventh grade for me. Uh yeah. people were like, how was you eleven? But I, I started school when I was four years old. So uh -huh. so I uh end up playing seventh, eighth grade, you know, of course, if you hadn't played something in, you know, never, you know, of course you wasn't that good at it. So, so, um, you know, my friends really motivated me to go out there just because I can have somebody to actually, you know, play with, uh, you know, around the house. So wh why not go out and try? So from the first day that I touched the basketball, um, I fell in love with it and my competitive nature kind of took over from there because we know how back then, you know, how rude, and, and and mean children can be. So, you know, everybody caught, gave me the nickname back in the day, Manuk Bowl. Um, and, and anybody that remember Manuk Bowl, he was like 7'7". Seven, seven. And, uh, you know, he was just one of those guys that was just tall. You know, wasn't very skilled at all, but he was just taller than everybody else. So that's how I got my nickname because I was just taller than everybody and wasn't very skilled at all. <laughs> all right, all right. So uh, who are some of your... Um influences growing up uh you know what man i didn't even watch sports at all like i didn't watch sports at all my, i didn't have a father in my life um like i didn't really have any influence and and it's sad for me to even say this um but like the people we looked up to when i was growing up was the drug dealers you know what i mean like that that was all we seen growing up we seen the drug dealers we seen that they had the cars they had the money and they had the girls Right. You know what I mean? Like, so that's who we looked up to because that's all we seen. And, and anybody know how small the town of Cocoa, Florida is, you know, we didn't go outside that city limit. You know what I mean? Like Orlando was an hour away. Daytona Beach was 45 minutes away. Cocoa Beach was 12 miles away, which is cities that we know. Saying so that was both my role models. Okay, cool. So talk about um, playing uh, basketball in the seventh grade. Uh, when did you really notice about your skill set at that age? I, I, I didn't know anything. And all I knew was to just get a rebound because I was taller than everybody else. Um, that was the only skill that I had to be able to go get it and find somebody to give the ball to um, because I couldn't dribble the basketball. Um, the only, and it wasn't even a skill that I had. I was just taller than everybody else. I was just bigger than everybody else. Like they say, you can't coach seven feet. That's kind of like how it was for me growing up. <laughs> I understand. Hey, so uh, once you reached uh, high school level, um, did you play right away as a freshman? Uh, it, it was funny, man, because after my eight, after my after my seventh grade year, man, and, and people talked about me so bad about being a, a horrible basketball player, man. I just took the time out to be able to to go to the gym every single day from the day that I picked up a basketball because I didn't like the fact that people talked about me so much. I always took any kind of negative that people said to, about me and tried to turn it into a positive. So from that very first day that I picked up a ball, I was in the gym every single day from the age of 11 years old because I wanted to be better every single day while everybody else was playing video games and outside playing, picking up and running and football and all that kind of stuff. I was sneaking away going on being on the basketball court. 
um, and working on my skills. So uh, for me, uh, just working, working, and working, and working, and then now um, a lot of people don't even know this, man. I didn't really get a lot of support when I was in, in Florida. Um, I come from a family with 16 aunties and uncles, um, about a million first cousins, man. But I can remember, like, only having, like, two or three people that was at the game that supported me. So man. so for me, so me when I went to uh, high school, it was so much different um, in this small town of Camilla, maybe because it was nothing else to do in this town. But um, what really took my, you know, my game from here to another level was that uh, when I looked up in the stands, I seen all my family members in the stands. And that just motivated me so much more because I had never had that many people in the stands to come and support me for a game. So, so to be able to get that experience, um, all I can think of, what can I do to be able to keep coming to the game? And that's what really made me work even harder every single day to try to get better because I got to do something in the game so my family can have something to cheer for and want to continue to come. That's right. There you go. All right. So talk about um, starting your first game uh, in high school. Uh, were you nervous? Um, you know, who do, who do you remember playing? And uh, how well did you play? How many points did you score? You know what, man? It, it was ner I was, it was nervous because you think like I come from a whole different state. You know what I mean? I, I'm at a, a whole different school. I don't really know people as well, you know, like I knew people growing up. So that was nervous all by itself. And then people looking at me like, oh, man, they thinking I'm really good because I'm tall, which I really wasn't. So to be able to go in the first game, I was nervous because I played B team in ninth grade. Oh, cool. I went and played B team, and all I can think, saying to myself, like, man, I'm so nervous out here, so I'm going to just go out here and get every rebound. <laughs> so when I went out there, I had like 22 rebounds and like seven points or something like that. Um, that was my first B-team game. And, and after that game, my high school coach came up to me. He was like, look here, man, that was your last B-team game, man. You playing you playing on varsity from here on out. <laughs> okay. That's good. 22 rebounds in your first start. That's go ahead, KJ. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was going to ask you, did you ever try out for uh, football in high school? <laughs> I did, man. Uh, I went out there. It's funny, man, when I tell people this. They were like, uh, they, they were like, did you ever play any other sports? I said, yeah, I played football for one day. They were like, well, what happened in the one day? So uh, they taught me out there to go in on the football field, and they had me at a tight end position. So they mm -hmm. drew up this play, had me going across the middle. So I jump up and pick up, uh, jump up to get the pass, but flip my leg from up on I land on my head. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so now I'm sitting here thinking, okay, man, I don't think this is supposed to happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? So now I'm like, uh, I'm like, okay, now I'm pissed off. I'm like, all right, man, you know what? I'm going to go hit me somebody. I said, man, I'm on defense now. They was like, no, nah, Jermaine, that's not how it works here. They was like, man, you only play on offense. So from that time, I took off my pads and my helmet, and I left them on the field that day and went back to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> Did the coach try to convince you to stay? Man, he was talking to me. I ain't hear nothing. Uh, <laughs> hey, you did the right thing by playing basketball. It seemed like it. That's what's up, man. <laughs> so you, you get to varsity level. Uh Whose spot did you take? Because, <laughs> you know, you had to start. 22 rebounds in the game. Come on. Well, you know what? I um I, I I don't remember starting until like like mid season. I don't even remember who I don't even remember who you know what actually I do remember whose spot it was. <laughs> I actually just uh just had lunch with him today. <laughs> <laughs> I just had lunch call him out. Cause, cause, cause he always tell me that I like he was like, Man, you just ruined my whole career when you came. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Willie Davis, man, he and him played the same position, and uh, once I came, I kind of took over his position, and he he was coming off the bench uh, for the rest of high school. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, talk about um the rivalries you guys had in um, high school, Camilla, Georgia. Who was your rivals down in South Georgia? Oh man, we we had, we played against a school called Randolph Clayton, man. Um, they 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 our biggest rivals because uh, anybody that 
knew about Mitchell Baker, man, we were going out teams. We were that good. Uh, like, I played the three position. I was six, seven, six, eight, three. So, we, we had a big team. Uh, we were talented. We were well coached. Uh, we was like a more machine, man. Uh, but the high school over, over in Randolph Clay, and they, they, they looked up just like us, had uh, real good coaching over there. And they were some country people. They were strong. They jumped high. And uh, those are those, the only team that we really had competition with every single year. Um, they had number one player, uh, Donnell Harvey, who, who came out, uh, uh, who went to the University of Florida. He was like the number one player in the country. At the time, they had Jerry Braswell, who played oh. for. Uh, they had a whole bunch of talent that, that played top level uh, basketball over at that time, and we had a whole lot of uh, we had a whole lot of talent coming out the country. <laughs> okay, cool. That's what's up. Um, so uh, going into high school, go ahead, go ahead, KJ. Yeah, yeah. That's when I asked, did y'all uh, make it to the playoffs or win any state titles? Yeah. And look here, man. I hate to even talk about it. It still, you know, it still hits home. I still get a little. I, I still feel the way about not winning the state champion. And, oh, uh, we had all the world. Like in my ninth grade year, we probably had the best team in the state. My tenth grade year, we had the best. State. My junior year, we make it to the state championship game, and and then we lose. And then my senior year, we lose to uh, one of the close friends, Dion. Uh, my senior year, so my junior and senior year, like I lost state championships, and 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 then when I left, when I left high school, they won four in a row. Wow! So I guess I was the problem. Damn. <laughs> Damn, <man. laughs> did, did you play any All Star games? I, I played. I played in all the All Star games uh, in high school. Won the dunk contest. Set the yeah. record most points in the All Star game. Pretty sure somebody broke it by now, but back then I had the record. So. <laughs> okay, cool. So talk about your recruitment process a little bit. At that time, you know, you made it to the uh, state championship, came up short, played in All Star games. Name some of the colleges that were actually, uh, you know, interested at the time, and why you chose Georgia. Man, you know what, man? Every school in the country recruited me coming out of high school, except for Georgia Tech. And North Carolina, and uh, Georgia Tech had uh, Matt Harper in that, and North Carolina had Antoine Jameson. Oh, so we we both we we all played positions. So those two schools that didn't recruit me, uh, in and it was tough for me to make a decision. But you know, me growing up, my father, uh, you know, growing up, I, ne I didn't have my father around, and then when I went to high school, my high school coach was my father figure. So, so in my recruiting process, my whole thing was a coach that I could have a father figure and a kid from the background that I from and can understand somebody up around and kind of can hold me closer to them, um, you know, be that. And uh, it's it hard going on that process because I was actually looking for somebody that looked like me, um, that kind of understand me more. Uh, Tubby Smith was at the University of Georgia at the time who, who actually recruited and, um, and and to set him apart from every school that I went to a visit was that every school that I went to had a paper with, with all kind of cash waiting in the world telling me I'm starting at the University of Georgia under Tubby Smith. He never promised me a start job and he didn't offer me and for me, like I always, that person always earned his way. All I do was to work hard and earn whatever what given to me. So that felt normal and regular situation where I had nobody gave me anything, and money just was something that never moved me at all. Even a kid that that never had nothing. Okay, cool, cool. So you get to Georgia and you started. Did you start your freshman year in the red shirt? And of course I started. That's why I went there. Because I had confidence that I was gonna be starting. You know, I had a guy that was there that was a junior, uh, and he had been starting by his career, but you know, I had worked hard, man. I had put all the work in. So I knew 
So all I wanted to do was ob- get an opportunity to start. And when they told me I was going to have a, my mind, I already knew I was going to be starting and mm-hmm. put the work in. You know, not that I had a big ego. I just had how much work that I was putting in and, and that I would go in and take somebody's position. And and that was the plan. My idea going, so I went in and I you know, got my position. I started and it was hard. You know, a lot of people would say it wasn't hard. Anybody that can remember. Oh, hey, I'm sorry, Jermaine. Can you hear me? Uh, can you go out and come back in? You choppy. Your audio went choppy again. All right. All right. Okay, Jay, you want to go back out and come back in when, when I hit a mid? All right, now let's just, let's just leave it like it is. All right. Yeah, you're good. There we go. Where were we? <laughs> Your freshman year? Yeah, my first year was uh, was tough on me, man, because my first four games I averaged seven points, and I was highly recruited, and a lot of people was comparing me to Dominique Wilkins. Um, you know, they was calling me the human highlight reel. They was calling me the thriller from Camilla, like all this kind of stuff. So I was highly recruited going in. So for me, um, it was a lot of pressure. And uh, to be able to go in my first four games and average seven points just won something when I was averaging 30 in high school. I was averaging 30 and 15. So coming into, you know, that SEC role and people having high expectations of me uh, made me reevaluate myself. Um, I really had to go back in the shop and, and, and really start working harder, watching film and learning things that I was doing wrong. And, uh, you know, after that, after them first four games, it was on. It was on after that. After I went back in the shop and reevaluated myself, man, it was it was more, um, you know, whoever was in front of me was getting the business. <laughs> so so what, what, what do you remember what game that was? Did you, got, you find your mojo? Um, I, I don't remember that, but I know it started in the SEC. We, we had started the, the conference play. You know, normally we play like four, four, four games before we get into conference play. And I remember the first game being being on the road. I think we was playing like South Carolina or somebody. And, you know, from there it was on. It was on from then on out. That's yeah. good. That's good. Yeah, I, I know uh, you was playing for Coach Tubby Smith. Coach Tubby Smith, right? Well, well, what's the funny thing behind that story is Tubby Smith recruited me, and 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 uh, soon as soon as I signed with the University of Georgia, he left and went to Kentucky. Yep. He left and went to Kentucky, so I ended up playing for his assistant coach. Yeah, yeah. How was that? Um, it, it was tough, man, because you know the main reason I went there was for Tubby, but but he really really filled the role. Um, even though he didn't look like me, he really um, filled the role that Tubby. Uh, that I wanted Tubby to feel. Um, and he really, like, did everything that I needed him to do and be there for me and, and supported me in every way that I needed. Um, you know, that that was major for me to be able to get that. gave me a whole different idea because how I grew up, you know, even going to University of Georgia was a culture shock for me because, you know, I grew up going to all black schools. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's how I grew up. If anybody know about University of Georgia, it's 30,000 students when I was there, and it was only 3,000 black students. And I grew up in a, I grew up in a space where, you know, all white people, I was, I was taught that all white people was racist. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's the environment that I grew up in, and, and the experiences that I had didn't show me any different. So to be able to go to University of Georgia and get that experience from, you know, different people and be I have a coach that doesn't didn't look like me kind of taught me so much about life to be able to be open to everybody, you know, just like the good guy, bad cop, you know, all cops are not bad. So it kind of gave me that kind of idea on the world and really gave me that co- like like to see different cultures in a different site, you know what I'm saying, and being open to to, to learn other people's culture and understand that, you know, it's bad apples in, in every bunch. So, so that was, that was, that was a great experience for me as far as culturally. 
Okay, cool. Yeah, hey, um, um, before every game, what music do you listen to to get ready for the game? <laughs> man, I was I was a Mary J, I was a Mary J. Blige fan. Man, I always felt like I had to listen to some slow music, man. Because anytime I got an opportunity to play on the basketball court, man, like my energy was like through the roof. So I felt like I had to listen to something that can kind of die me down from, uh, from really exploding and, and going nuts. You know what I'm saying? Because I always, <laughs> like, every game, man, I thought, like, like man, every game I looked at it as an opportunity to get better and show somebody how good I was. So uh, I, I really wanted to kind of tone my energy down um, until the game started, man, and, and, and Mary J did that for me. <laughs> What's up, man? <laughs> That's a good one. A good question, KJ. So, uh, you know, you guys get into the NIT while you're at Georgia. Talk about that experience. Did you guys ever make it to the NCAA tournament? Man, man, we regret playing in the NIT, man, because that's not what we wanted. Everybody uh -huh. always talked about the NIT stand for not in tournament. So, so <laughs> that for me, that that struck that struck me a way I didn't want to be a part of it. Um, but you know. I, I like I told I told my teammate I say man this ain't where we want to be man but we here so let's make the best of it man so we end up making the final four uh, my first year at the University of Georgia and then the next year man like we made NIT again just so happened to miss the tournament and uh, end up playing the NIT again both my two years at UGA we played there it was a good experience but that's just not something that we wanted man it was just like who's gonna be the best loser. <laughs> hey, uh, hey, talk about leaving your junior year and uh, getting ready for the NBA. Well, I actually left my sophomore year, man, and I didn't have any. Yeah, yeah, I left my I left after my second year, man. I had no intentions on leaving school at all. Um, uh, they fired the coach after my second year, and I had led the SEC in scoring. I was second in rebounds in the conference. Um. You know, I had agents reaching out to me. Like, I had everything. You know, everybody projecting me to be a lottery pick. But I didn't want to leave school because I was having that much fun at the University of Georgia. You know what I mean? I, like, I was really enjoying the campus. I was enjoying everything about my college experience. So, um, you know, I just wanted to meet up with the coach, Jim Herrick, who came in and just kind of get an idea on how he was as a basketball coach. And, um, you know, just to be able to talk to him and get to know him a little bit. And, uh, you know, at, at the end of our conversation, he asked me, was I coming back to school? And I was like, well, I'm going to meet with my family and, and I'll let you know my answer in the morning. But in my mind, I was coming back to school because I had Donnell Harvey coming to the University of Georgia. He was the yeah. number one player in the country coming yep. there. You know what I mean? I had D.A. Lane, who was a scorer. I was like, man, we about to, we really about to make the tournament this year. So I was already turning the state until yeah. he told me he was like, look here, Jermaine, man, if you leave school right now, you'll be pumping gas in ten years. Oh, and for me, that was like a slap in my face because okay. of, of, of everything that I had already worked hard for and I had already accomplished. And 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 the reason why I got where I was is because of hearing people say the kind of stuff that he was saying. Like that drove me to work harder and do things in a different way. So, you know, once he said that to me, in my mind, I'm like, I'm out of here. You know, I was very respectful, re respectful of what, you know, what he said. I shook his hand. I say, we'll talk in the morning. And as soon as I left outside that meeting, I called Donnell Harvey and I called D.A. Lane. I say, man, I'm out of here. And he was like, they was like, man, what happened? I was like, man, the man just told me I'd be pumping gas in 10 years if I leave school. Oh, man. And, 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 and he was like, what? I said, yeah. So I called the agent. I called one of the agents. I said, man, set up me some workouts. And he was like, really? You leaving out? I said, yeah. You told me I was going to be lottery. So, you know, going to my first workout, man, uh, first workout I went to, man, I wrote on a piece of paper, pumping gas in 10 years. And I taped it on the wall. So when I woke up in the morning, I could see it. You know what I'm saying? So that was my motivation. Like I always, like I said, even as a young kid, man, I always like to turn a negative into a positive. And, and, and that was my way of showing him, you know what I mean? Like I'm going to be in the league longer than 10 years. <laughs> there you go. All right. All right. So talk about going into the draft. Uh, talk about that process. Who were the teams that was kind of get you after you did your workouts? Man, it 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 was tough. The draft was tough, man, because we had so many threes coming up. 
like a lot of people don't remember. We had Wally Zerbiak coming out, James yeah. Posey run our test. Uh, uh, who else we had, man? We we had Lamar Odom at the three. We had uh, Core McGetty. Uh, man, we had so many uh, players at the three position. Uh, Manu Ginobili, you know what I'm saying, in our draft that was at the three. But I was projected to be a lottery pick. I was at the draft. I had only worked out for the lottery teams. So I'm at the draft waiting on my turn. I had talked to Cleveland Cavaliers who had number 11 pick. They said, Jermaine, if we can't get Sean Marion – I forgot to mention Sean Marion was in that draft. Yeah, he another three. And he was like, they was like, listen here, Jermaine, if uh, if, if we can't get Sean Marion at 11, we're going to draft you. So Sean Marion went to nine. He went nine to Phoenix. So now 11 coming around. I'm like, yeah, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to Cleveland. Mm -hmm. And they drafted Trajan Langer at 11, yep. who nobody expected to be drafted in the first round. Yep. And they were supposed to get a three-man. So that kind of screwed everything up for me and who I worked out for. So I'm sitting around here now, like, nervous, like, what's going on, man? Like, I'm looking at my agent like, man, I ain't worked out for none of these other teams. And he was like, man, you know, don't worry. Things going to work itself out. And and I was just nervous. All I was thinking in my mind, like, man, I should have went back to school. <laughs> that's what I was thinking in my mind. And yeah. then, uh, you know, luckily, and that's why I always talk to kids all the time about representing yourself in a way and your family in a way. I just so happened to be going to a workout with the 76ers. Well, it wasn't a workout with the 76ers. I was went to one of their practices and uh, was watching them practice. And I got a chance to talk to Larry Brown for like an hour. And uh, me and him had a conversation, man. And we, we sat down and talked. And, and at the end of our conversation, he was like, Jermaine, he, he was like, man, he said, I hate that, that we won't have an opportunity to draft you. He say, but man, you such a great kid. I wish I could be able to coach you and be able to get you on our team, but I know it's no ch no chance you're gonna be gone in the lottery. And luckily, you know what I mean. That's how I got end up being with the 76ers, just off me just being who I am and having a conversation with Larry Brown. He 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 talked with the Hawks about drafting me and and, and working out the logistics later. And, and that's how I got drafted, being in the 27th pick. Because in the NBA, if other teams see, like, man, why nobody draft Jermaine, they think there's something wrong with you. Like, somebody knows something that, that we don't know. We so don't we know, don't yeah. We ain't <laughs> touching them. <laughs> you yeah. see what I'm saying? So that's kind of how it went for me. I went from being a projected lottery pick into being drafted the 27th pick in the first round. Wow. They, they talk about playing with one of the greats, Allen Iverson. Man, it was it, it's crazy playing with AI, man. Uh, you know, just watching him at Georgetown and watching his career. Um, you know, just watching all the adversity that he had went through to be able to get to where he was and to be able to actually get in and, and, and see somebody that had so much passion for the game of basketball, man, and just had so much God given talent. Um, I never seen anybody that just go as hard as he did on the basketball court at his size. So to watch that night in and night out, man, it was unbelievable. Sometimes you just get caught watching and forget that you on his team. <laughs> yeah. Is he really that fast on the court? Man, I, man, I always tell people, man, he was, he was, he was the fastest and the quickest. P wow. People don't understand, like. It's two different things. Yeah. Like, it's yeah. rare to be fast and quick. That's who mm -hmm. Allen Iverson was. He was fast and quicker than everybody else out on the basketball court. Mm. Hey, did you have to go? Did you ever have to go against him uh, in practice? Nah, man. Y'all, everybody know he ain't practice. <laughs> <laughs> You talking about practice? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I mean, no, man. Like, like Allen Iverson was somebody. If people understand, like Allen Iverson was somebody who always led the NBA in minutes. You know, what I mean, he he played 46, 47 minutes a night, and people don't know. Like this man played hurt almost every night. He was always hurt. So man. the reason he didn't practice, what nobody says to you, is because he was rehabbing. He was rehabbing whatever injuries he had. So yeah. that was one of the reasons he didn't practice much. But he gave us everything he had in the game. So, you know, that was something we appreciated. <laughs> ah. Ah. Yeah. yeah. So uh, talk about going to the NBA Finals in 2001 with the 76ers and playing against uh, one of the um, Laker dynasties with Kobe and Shaq. Talk about uh, playing against those guys. 
Man, that's the dream, man. The dream is to go to the NBA Finals and win it. You know what I'm saying? That be, you know, I was 21 years old at the time, man. Somebody that came from Cocoa, Florida, born and raised, to be able to say that if somebody told me I'll be starting in the NBA Finals, no way I would believe that I'm playing in, in, in the Staples Center, playing against Shaq in his prime, Kobe in his prime, and I'm starting in the NBA Finals and having an opportunity to win. You know what I mean, and be able to go and, and and hear my name, like 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 I had to fly my mom and my aunt, like I wanted to fly my family out just so that they can be able to hear my name being called starting in the NBA Finals, man. Like that just brought chills to my whole body just hearing it. You know what I mean? At 21 years old, where I'm from, man, that just don't happen. So 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 for me, man, that was, like that was the biggest blessing for me to just predicate to all the work that I had put in and, and and not to be like man like like I put in the work to be able to earn that you know what I mean so, mm -hmm. so to get that opportunity just pretty much just spoke volumes to me on, on my work ethic and and the reason why I was there was was definitely um you know something that I earned and it wasn't given <laughs> most definitely most definitely <clears throat> talk about the buzzer beater man and uh and what happened in the locker room with the equipment manager? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Um, <laughs> it, it's funny because people still ask me now because I tell like like when I when I represent myself, I, I say Jermaine Jones Hall of Famer, and, and people are like, man, you ain't no Hall of Fame. Why you keep on talking about you a Hall of Famer? <laughs> So, so, so what it is in 1999, uh, we played the last game um, in 1999. You know what I mean? So, so, so now, um, I wasn't even playing. I was a rookie. You know what I mean? Larry Brown didn't really believe in playing rookies that much. Whoa. So I just so happened to be able to get into the game um, late. You know what I mean? We were down by like thirty points or something. We had like five minutes. We down thirty. So yeah. this scrub time. I'm getting this scrub time. In. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I get out there. I'm like, man, I'm going to get me some buckets. Try to earn me some time. So I went. <laughs> so I went out there. I'm getting me buckets, and then. Now it's like the uh you know the time running out. I'm still trying to get buckets, so I throw the ball up from past half court and just throw it up and it hit the bank shot. So I'm like, yeah. So so I'm looking at it myself like, yeah. Now I got seven. <laughs> yeah, man. I, I got seven points in five minutes. So you know I'm happy about that. You know what I mean? Yeah, we lost, but you know what I mean. Hope the coach see that and, and play me a little more next game. So I go into the locker room and the uh equipment manager come up to me like, look here, Jermaine, man, we need we need your shoes, we need your uniform, we need all this kind of stuff. So I'm sitting here in my mind thinking like, like, man, I, I thought they had cut me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, man, why this man like cause they normally don't ever do that? Like, why you want my shoes and my uniform and all that kind of stuff? They ain't knowing what happened. He say, Man, look here, congratulations, man. You just hit the last shot of the millennium. And they want your stuff to be able to put it in the Hall of Fame in Connecticut. I said, what? And he's like, yeah, man, congrats. And I was sitting up there like, man, like that was the biggest smile on my face, man. We lost by we lost by 30, but it was good. You know, everybody in the locker room was congratulating me on uh, being a part of the Hall of Fame for hitting that last shot of the millennium. That's what's up, man. So talk about um, when Alan Iris hit that shot over top Coach Tyrone Lou, and he stepped on, what did he say? On the way to the bench, the timeout. <laughs> man, man. First of all, like people don't understand that wasn't actually on the basketball court. Like Allen Iverson was complaining the whole game about Tyrone Lue holding him and, and grabbing him and all that kind of stuff. But you know, Allen Iverson was still doing his thing. But he's still like ref, man. He holding me every single time. He can't guard me. Only way he can guard me is doing what he's doing. Call the foul. So you know, going down the stretch, going down the stretch, we up. I think we up like two. Or four points, and they were trying to make a run, and uh, you know he put that move on the man, and and uh, shot the shot, knocked it down, and Tyrone Lue ended up falling, and, and and I already know what he was saying. I already know he's saying, like like motherfucker, I told you you can't guard me, and stepped over him, man. And, and, and now everybody talk about that same shot, man. It's on every poster. Anytime you talk about Allen Iverson, you're gonna see that. You're gonna see that shot, and I'm just blessed and happy to even be in the gym and and be a part of it, to be able to be right there to see it. <laughs> All right. All right.
right. So, so talk about uh, playing against Kobe in that game, in that series. You, you had to guard him. What kind of stuff he was saying to you? Like, just Man, keep look, it real. Look here, I'm not saying nothing to the mumble. You know what I'm saying? Like, all I knew – was that I was going to try to make it hard for him to catch the basketball. I was going to make him hard. I'm going to grab. I'm going to hold. I'm going to do everything I can before he catch the basketball. Because I know once he catch that basketball, man, I'm at his mercy. You know what I'm saying? This man get paid to put the ball in the cup. And I got, I could play the best defense I want to play. And this man still can score 50 on you. So, I mean, to be able to play against Kobe in his prime, Shaq in his prime, and then playing against arguably the best – role players that ever played the game and Derek Fisher, Rick Fox, you know what I'm saying? And then Robert Ory, who can go down in history, should be in the Hall of Fame, I think, man, with all the championships he's won. You know, it was just our backs was against the wall. But, uh, like, like if, if anybody had watched it, man, it wasn't like they blew us out, man. We Every game was a game. Yeah, you know what I'm saying we we had a chance to win every game, man. But Shaq was just too much for us. Kobe Kobe, Kobe did his thing, man. But he didn't hurt us. It was Shaq. Shaq yeah. was the one that was you know punishing <laughs> us, and we had the best defender who did the best job on Shaq all year. But it just wasn't enough, man. Shaq 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 was abusive back then. <laughs> so you so you need go ahead, KJ. Yeah, uh, you and Kobe, y'all was teammates as well. Talk about that experience. Uh, I said you and Kobe was teammates as well. Talk about that experience. I, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Man. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. All right. Go back out. And come go back. Out. Yeah. Yeah, I figured something happened again. Yeah. I think somebody called him while we while he was talking. Yeah. Something like that. That's what's happening every time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There it is. There it is. All right. All right. Yeah, what what was the question? Yeah, yeah, I said you and Kobe was teammates. Talk about that experience. Man, that was probably one of the best experiences I had, man, to be able to uh to be honest with you, man, uh Kobe was one of those players that I didn't really care for, man. Uh, before I started playing with him and being on a team with him. And the reason being, a lot of people don't even know why they don't like Kobe. But I was such a Michael Jordan fan, I didn't like the fact that he was trying to be Mike. You know what I mean? Like, why you Mike walking like Mike? Why you chewing your gun like Mike? You know what I mean? Like, you doing everything like Mike. <laughs> Until I played with him, man, and kind of got a clearer understanding on who he was and what he represented, man, and see his work ethic was like – unbelievable his like being a student of the game is like on another level that i had never seen before like this was a true definition of being professional and being about your craft um kobe was in the gym ain't no telling even when kobe was getting in the gym man because i was one of those guys that got in like an hour early to come, go in and work on my craft man when i got there kobe was drenched in sweat you know what i'm saying so ain't no telling what time he used to get in there and, and he was one of those guys that he was the first one in there. He was the last person to leave. And he was one of those superstar players, which no superstar really practiced that much. You know what I mean? Like Kobe was practicing and approaching practice just like he was the games. Like the same Kobe you've seen in games was the same Kobe that you was going to see uh, at practices. And, and, and I couldn't never understand why, but I learned so much from him just asking him questions and See how he dissect the game, how he watched film, man. Kobe, Kobe even like studied the playbook with the referee. Like referees made, you know, call. Like he would study the referee book, like all of this stuff to try to get ahead on the game, man. Like this guy was like unreal when it came to the game of basketball, man. Um, just to be able to play with such greatness and 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 somebody that was so passionate about the game. Um, he, he, he just turned me to a whole nother level, you know, just to see somebody like that. And I always say that, man, if your best player doing what Kobe's doing, it's no, uh, like, you don't have no excuses but to try to match what he doing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He's one of the best players in the league. Like, how can you not come in here and try to get the same effort that he's giving out here? And I couldn't ever understand him. I'm like, Kobe, why are you out here practicing like this? You don't even have to. 
He was like, man, because I don't want y'all to think that because y'all get an opportunity to shoot at practice that you're going to get a chance to shoot in the game. So I kind of keep it consistent for y'all. Y'all ain't going to shoot, right, shoot in the game. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, you're savage. <laughs> so what was this? How, how, how was this relationship with Phil Jackson? Um, did you see any similarities in him and Mike and Phil? Well, you know, I, um, you know, uh, Rudy Tom John Johnovich was our coach uh, when I played for the Lakers, and then I ended up going to, to training camp with Phil Jackson. Man, um, I tell you what, man, you know, to play for Larry Brown, who's a Hall of Fame coach, uh, when I was with the Seventy Sixers, um, you know, it was an honor playing with him, man. But when you talk about Phil Jackson, man, he like he was one of those mental coaches. Like he was one of those coaches that can get everything out of you mentally. Like he would play mind games with you to be able to get you on that level. You know what I'm saying? To be able to go out and compete and, and, and say certain things to you to motivate you to go play basketball. But Larry Brown was like one of those coaches that was a genius when it came to X's and O's. You know, X's and O's, Larry Brown, man, for two straight years, anytime we called a timeout, we was shooting free throws or we were scoring. And these were plays that he was running that was just on the top of his head. Like plays we hadn't ran all year. <laughs> Every time out, he got a new play to run. Something we and we would only run that one time. We wonder why we ain't run these plays all year. So, you know, to be able to talk about coaches like Larry Brown and 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 and, and Phil Jackson, man, really pretty much where I got my IQ of basketball from to be able to learn from them and and, and you know, watch players like like Kobe Bryant, who was a student, helped me be a better student of the game. Um, you know, who who gonna coach Michael Jordan and and and, and Kobe Bryant and win all these championships? And you don't want to learn from them. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I was more of a sponge, learning from Kobe and learning from you know the guys that was on the team that had more years than me. Man, I always was that person. That wanted to be learning, and who else better than learn from somebody that got ten ring? There you go. Well, I got some, <laughs> I got some highlights, man, with you uh, playing for the Lakers. We're gonna get in a couple clips uh, for everybody that's watching. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube. Um, we have special guest Jermaine Jones, former NBA small forward, played for the Lakers, Phoenix Suns, Cleveland Cavaliers, and a few other teams. All right, let's go ahead and get into this clip real quick. Ray Allen now with nine, matching Chucky Atkins, Odom down inside, oh, what a play by Jermaine Jones. Now rebounders have an attitude that every shot is a miss, they don't stand and react after the fact, they start reacting before, that's what Jermaine Jones did and made a highlight. Alright, so Jermaine with Tomahawk put back up. Against the uh, Seattle Sonics. I, I, I still had a little bit of hops back then. <laughs> yeah, he cleared it pretty good. He cleared it pretty good. Um, so, uh, you know, I got another clip. I think you were playing for uh, the Charlotte Bobcats at this time. Um, he was doing the whoopsie daisy on them at, up in the Phoenix Suns. So, um, on Steve Nash and company. Let's go ahead and look at that one real quick. <laughs> They're explosive, high-energy players. Well, explosive going vertical, too. Both of them actually started the game jumping center. Now, play. He's getting his ankles taped right now. So is it a finger, Scotty? Was it a finger or was it a... Well, during warm-ups, huh? And here is Jermaine Jones, who's a long... Bobcats are shooting 80% here in the early going. Up it comes now to Jermaine Jones. And Jones, a lot of people... He just only knows one speed, and that's full speed ahead. And, and we just were so fortunate to be able to watch him play every night. Boy, Jermaine Jones is off to a good start. He turns around and do it the way he would like to have. Starting to say Kareem Rush has come to the ball game now. He's coming off of a big game. He scored in the last game 28 points. From also. Nice. Not able to get it to go. Brevin Knight brings it down. Of course, Brevin Knight was a former son for a little over a month. And here's a long shot by Wade by the Bobcats last year after 13 games into the season. Two on one, and Rush finishes. Diaw trying some out as they came out, picked him up at half court. Jermaine Jones looking inside now. Seven minutes to go in the first half. Into Felton, and Felton, what, $150 to Suns Charities. Well, Steve did a great job of getting the paint. They have to double down on him. He finds the open guy. But Jermaine Jones, 
He's been a shot doesn't go. Bosco dumps it outside. Here comes Knight. Sean Marion getting ready to come back in for the stretch run from the corner. That is Jones of huge 26 of 27. That's been huge in this game. Monty McCutcheon puts it up and the tip and Marion has to hustle over and then Jones comes up with a steal and the basket and that is a big thanks to Sheila Simpson our stage manager Tom Delnos our status. Yes, sir. You went off that game. <laughs> yeah, buckets. man. It brought, it brought yeah. back memories, man. I, I was still getting a little few buckets out there. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. I, like, I saw the fadeaway and turn around like Kobe. I was like, uh oh, he's been working with Kobe in practice. <laughs> okay. I saw it. I was like, yo, he got it down. Absolutely. That's Kobe move. Kobe taught him that. <laughs> he left it with it and started with it. Absolutely. <laughs> sir. So, uh, talk about playing with Charlotte, man. What was the atmosphere like playing down there? Man, you know what, man? It was amazing playing for that organization, man. I've been very blessed to be able to play with some of the top organizations in the sport of basketball, man. Being able to play for the 76ers, who's a top organization, the Lakers, um, Boston Celtics, um, one of the top organizations as well. But it was real meaningful for me to be able to play with the Charlotte Bobcats because uh, I think a lot of people don't understand. Like, that was the first uh, black owner, Bob Johnson, owned the team uh, that year. So to be able to get an opportunity to play, you know, for the first black owner, man, meant everything to me. So I was going to make sure every time I put that Bobcat jersey on, man, I was going to try to represent him well. So mm -hmm. so that was definitely an uh, honor to be able to to be able to do that. And, and, and I'm glad now, even though this is the Charlotte Hornets, uh, they still got MJ over there that's running. <laughs> okay. Right. I knew it. Yeah. Yep. Hey, talk about playing overseas for eight years. Man, you know what, man? It, it, it's totally different over there, man. But I love every minute of it. Um, you know, to be able to play in Italy for four years, to be able to uh, play in Israel, Russia, Bulgaria, Mexico, uh, to be able to travel the world, man, playing in different countries every every uh, every week, man. I done filled up like three passports just traveling the world because I invested in a in in a in an eight dollar basketball. Um, to be able to get that experience, to be able to, you know, experience different cultures, uh, just to be able to get that experience, man, says a lot, um, you know, where the game of basketball can take you if you're really investing in it. Um, you know, a lot of people look at me as being uh, this genius, man, but I think just me traveling the world and being able to understand people more, understanding different cultures, kind of grow your brain and be able to see things differently uh, than most. So just getting that experience, man, was 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 great. And not only me getting that experience, man, I gave my daughters the opportunity to be able to travel uh, overseas and 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 be fluent in Italian, uh, to be able to play in Israel, man. And we go to uh, Jerusalem, and for my daughters to be sit there and tell me like, Dad, you know, I read about this in the Bible, and to be able to give them that experience as well uh, meant the world to me. And, uh, you know, just, you know, this was probably ha something that happened like a month ago uh, to me. My, my, my two daughters came up to me and we were just having a conversation and, and, and they told me like, Dad, like, you don't really understand how much we appreciate the fact that you gave us an opportunity to travel the world because, you know, we, we really look at people and not understand them because I think we see the world so much different because we traveled it. You know what I mean? And that just brought so much, like, like I wanted to break down and cry in front of them, man. But you, to be able to, you know, to, to hear them at such a young age, at 18 and 16 years old, to know and to be able to appreciate that, man, at such a young age meant so much to me to be able to give them that. <laughs> yeah, yes, sir. Well, let's go ahead and take a clip, look at this clip from you overseas real quick. Uh, for everybody that's watching, uh, we have a special guest, a uh, former NBA small forward, uh, Jermaine Jones uh, played with the University of Georgia, played with the Lakers, 76ers, Phoenix Suns, Cap Cleveland Cavaliers as well. And now we're going to get into this clip. Uh, this is when he played overseas. Uh, so, Jermaine, stay with us, all right? This is probably our last clip for the night.
right, all right, we're back. So Jermaine, talk about your experience playing overseas. What year did you uh, leave the NBA and play it overseas? Yeah, I went. I was in the NBA from '99 to uh, 2007. Man, uh, that was my first year. Well, I was actually um, going towards my ninth year. I tried out for the New Jersey Nets, and uh, uh, this is when Jason Kidd and and Vince Carter and Richard Jefferson and all of them was on that uh, New Jersey Nets team. And I went there, and uh, the backup point guard, which was a uh, a guy, a point guard from Illinois at the time. And when he got hurt, I knew that it was going to be a slim chance of me making that team. And I was a veteran at the time. I had to play eight years. So I knew then uh, I wasn't making that team. So I went right after that day. Um, I went to meet with the management and, and, and asked him, was it okay for me to be able to explore other, other teams? And then that's when I knew, you know, it's time for me to go overseas. My agent was trying to get me to sit around and wait on somebody to get hurt in the NBA. And I was like, man, look here, what if nobody ever get hurt? I said, man, I'm in the best shape of my life. I'm not going to be sitting around waiting on somebody to get hurt. I'm not even going to put that in the air for somebody to get hurt. So I was, uh, you know, that's when I took my first job over in Italy, which was, which, which was different for me because I never seen myself playing overseas at all. Um, I, I see myself having a career in the NBA, but then, you know, I went over there humble um, because most of the time, you know, any NBA guy that put, had any experience went overseas, they end up sending them home after a week because the game is so much different and their mentality is they go over there and think like I played in the NBA, I'm so much better than the rest of the team and, and the rest of these players over there. So, so, so the thing was I went over there humble and I went over there and let everybody know why I was in the league, you know what I'm saying? So to be able to go over there and get that experience and, you know, eat some of that good Italian food and be able to see, you know, playing there for four years, man, even now, you know, so many people that, you know, talk to me about, you know, coming back to Italy and doing a lot of things over there, man, that experience really uh, was major for me. I really enjoyed that experience more than I did the NBA because it was different. Uh, the grind was different. You know what I mean? Like if you if you lost a game, it doesn't matter. If you had sixty points, it's the American fault. You know what I mean? Because because it was only two Americans that can be on a team over in Italy, and I like that. You know what I'm saying? Because I took that amongst myself to be the man. You know what I'm saying? So so when we lose a game, I'm gonna take that on my chest. But when we win, I want all the praise. So to me, I'm cool with all of that. You know what I mean? So so going over there humbly and being able to play for the, some of the best coaches. Uh, in the world, you know, taking that mentality, I was pretty much coaching teams on my own over there. You know what I mean? I was I was recruiting guys like, man, give me give me two twenty point scores and give me a couple shooters, and we're gonna be competing for a championship. Mm -hmm. And and that's the way it was every every single time. Uh, every team I was on over there, and I was able to win three championships while I was over there. Mm -hmm. All right, I see they uh, cut the lights out on you over there. Yeah, they shut them off on me. <laughs> Yeah, man. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, just go ahead and wrap it up, man. Um, if you got any shout outs or um, you can let the people know what you got going on right now. And uh, also you can, uh, you know, thank anybody that, you know, played along in your journey. It could be family members, friends, uh, teammates, you know. First, I want you to let the people know what you got going on now. Well, well, first of all, first, first, first and foremost, man, I want to appreciate you guys for having me on the show, man. I appreciate y'all for giving me this platform to even, uh, you know, speak on a lot of things. But what, what, what Jermaine Jones is doing right now, man, I think is bigger than basketball, man. I'm a real big mental health advocate. Um, you know, I work with a lot of kids. Um, from what I found out, like a lot of people don't even know that, you know, after the game stopped – the basketball stopped bouncing for me. I went through like a three year depression. Um, you know, I went through that process, man, just being scared to, to, to be able to speak out and be able to scared to even ask for help to be able to, you know, not be embarrassed was a lot, man, you know, playing this game for so long. And, uh, you know, people think that you're supposed to be okay because you got money, you know what I'm saying? And that just, people don't understand how much stuff that comes with you making money and the stuff that comes with it. So the things, what I'm doing now, I'm helping all professional athletes from all different walks of, of being an athlete 
baseball, football, you know, any of that helping them throughout their transition because I went through that transition. Um, it was tough for me. I went through the NBA transitioning program to help me trying to reprogram myself. So all I'm doing now is being able to lay out platforms for these athletes to be able to speak out. And, uh, you know, we just, we just had a guy uh, speak out. Uh, you know, we got Steve Francis who's speaking out on a lot of things now, just getting guys because people don't understand once you start speaking out on your mental illness and the thing that you 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 struggle with, um, you know, that's healing within itself. So so for me, I'm, I'm laying out that platform and then I'm learning, like, what can I do to be able to help people before they get to that? So that's when I transition to helping kids you know what i mean because that's where a lot of my trauma came from witnessing murder at 13 years old a lot of stuff that i went through as a child um, things that i was seeing that i thought was normal was something that kind of came back and something that i had to deal with and to for me to be able to become a better person to be able to become a better father to be able to become a better husband when i was one i had to learn how to be a better version of myself and, uh, you know, that's just something that I wanted to do for the kids and try to get them to open up and talk about things that's going on in their life right now. So I'm, I'm working with uh, everything. I'm using my platform as a professional athlete to get the kids to come in. Uh, and then we go in and talk about things that's bigger than just basketball. So my organization is called Beyond the Hardwood. And, and that's exactly what I talk about. You know, it's only a 1% chance you're going to make this NBA. What are the things that you got? In, in, in plan B and plan C to try to get them and let them understand the other opportunities that's out here in this world and, and things that we need, especially in our community. We need to see more attorneys. We need to see more doctors that look like us. We need to see, you know, a lot more of these things and those are the things I'm opening our eyes up to our youth. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a trip out in Africa. I'm, I'm taking four HBCUs out in Johannesburg, Africa. I'm bringing in the mental health piece to be able to talk to them about the importance of of of, of self. You know what I mean? Self care and being able to take care, uh, you know, things that you may have, you know, experience and being able to go and get that help. And, and that's one of the things I do with the professional athletes that come to see me. I'm not a therapist by far. I'm not licensed to do any of that. But my job is to be able to speak on the things that I experience, to be able to get them to open up, to speak on their things, and let them know that it's okay that I went and went and got that professional help. And it, and 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 it's, and it's hard. It's hard to ask for help when you've been the man your whole life. You know what I mean? The people looking at you as Superman, you you know your whole life. And 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 even as a kid growing up, people looking to treating you differently because you're that good in your sport. You know what I mean? So it's hard for us to, as athletes to ask for that kind of help. So I try to make it normal for people to ask for that, just speaking on my experience and showing them that I've got the help and, and the things that I've done and things I'm continue to doing now is building a platform for everybody that want to go talk um, and, and do it because the suicide rate is the highest rate it's ever been in the world for us, our youth. So I'm there to be able to help help our youth. I'm 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 building a community center right now because I learned that if we're talking to our kids and we're getting them together and they're going home to broken homes, then that's defeat the purpose on what we're doing. So we're trying to do try to get it where our community is involved and try to get the parents involved as well. Try to help them get the jobs and have them talk about things that's interfering with them being better parents and stuff like that because they deal with a lot as well from their trauma. And, and things they dealt with with their childhood. So that's what I'm big on to try to move and make this world a better place and try to invest in things like my, my guy Kobe Bryant say, man, basketball is big, but wait till, I sit, wait till you see what I do after the game is over. So that's my version of Kobe that I'm trying to do something bigger than basketball. There you go. Man, what Mr. Jones? <laughs> what yeah. Yeah. Any any shout outs to any uh anybody out there before we head out? Yeah, I want to give a shout out to my coach, uh Coach McDuffie, man. He was my first father figure, man. It really, you know, grind me, man, and it really taught me the game and be able to put make me listen, man, because I was so athletic being in high school. And he 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 was that person like, look here, man, you got to start learning and do something else other than just dunk the basketball. Say, and I used to be like, for what? I'm gonna just dunk every time. So, you know, just for him, just being that father figure and investing his time in me, helping me become the person that I, I've been, all the coaches and anybody that was involved in my growth, uh, AAU coaches, you know, college coaches, NBA coaches that 
really uh, helped me throughout my way, man. I'm re really appreciative of that, and I always appreciative of anybody that's investing their time in me, man. So I so so I appreciate you guys for letting me on the, on the show. Uh, we appreciate you coming on, man. No problem. We love to have you back on anytime. The shop is always open. For everybody that's watching, appreciate you guys tuning in. You just witnessed another edition of Sports Shop 27. I'm your host, Jermaine Coulter. I'd like to thank my, my co-host, Kevin Johnson, KJ, and also uh, today's special guest, uh, former UGA small forward and NBA small forward, uh, Jermaine Jones. All right? Um, you know how we say it before we head out. It's not how you start. It's how you finish. And uh, also, you guys be safe. Wear your masks. And we'll see you next time, okay? Uh, we appreciate it, Jermaine. Appreciate it, bro. All right. <laughs>